give me a kiss to pill a dream on And my imagination will thrive upon that kiss mm, sweetheart, I ask no more than this Hello! Welcome. Uh, I'm going to be building my new PC in the background while I discuss my thoughts on the Fallout series. So enjoy that, I guess, if you want. It's not a Fallout-themed PC or anything. It's just I was due for an upgrade and I had the B-roll. All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, video game to film adaptations are famously difficult to make, and I think there are a few reasons for that. You see, usually when a piece of media is adapted into a movie or television show, it's gaining something in the process. You know, books, plays, musicals, comics, and screenplays are all built upon in the process of being transformed into a motion picture. So even if the result isn't as good as the source material necessarily, there's still an incredible amount of building that needs to occur to make a story physically tangible enough to be captured through video. Does that make sense? I don't know. But video games are kind of different. For one, story in a video game is always secondary, or maybe even tertiary, depending on the game. I think, personally, engaging mechanics and compelling design are the bones of any great game. Everything else is an afterthought. Story can still be very important, some games choose to make it the primary focus, but the best story in the world won't carry a game that's objectively unpleasant to play. That's always the minimum barrier to entry. So while you can strip away the gameplay and adapt just the narrative of a popular game series, the process is always reductive. Typically, the story of a game becomes a little unexceptional when all of its ludic elements are pulled away. I think the best case scenario for a video game adaptation is a movie or show that manages to adapt the plot and capture some element of the game's theming. The Resident Evil movies, for instance, are good. They're fun, over-the-top, gory action romps that leverage the world-building and atmosphere of the games to make some decent zombie flicks. You know, uh, the Last of Us series is a nice way for people who haven't ever or wouldn't ever play the game to experience the compelling narrative that gamers were introduced to all the way back in 2013. I think it's fair to say that in both of these instances, even though they are successful video game adaptations, the end product still sits decidedly in the shadow of its source material. It's like a well-executed taxidermy in some ways. It's like, okay, yeah, you know, that's cool. I can put that in, in my living room and I can't put a a real fox in my living room, but a real fox can, can do a lot more than, you know, a taxidermy fox. And look, don't get me wrong, sometimes this is totally adequate for adapting a game. It results in a movie that's fun to watch and absolutely worth pursuing if you want to, but it seems like movie studios have struggled to figure out how to actually build upon a video game in, instead of just salvaging it for useful parts. The Fallout show manages to be different, and I think it accomplishes that by doing one extremely important thing. It doesn't adapt the games. It adds to them. This is an ambitious exercise. Others have tried it to a limited effect. In the past, when a movie and game share a universe, they tend to steer clear of one another when it comes to plot. And I think this often happens because there's limited communication between the creative teams of separate projects, especially something as different as a video game and a movie. So it's better to just isolate the stories beyond the occasional character cameo or Easter egg. Otherwise, they'll inevitably contradict one another, and one of the two will have to be steamrolled in order to maintain the canon. This is what happened with Arcane, the League of Legends show on Netflix. The lore of the games up to the point of the show's release was a little bit muddled and contradictory, so the show was advertised as taking place in-universe and being official canon content. In Arcane's case, the game's lore was messy to begin with, so it was convenient to let the show overtake it as the primary source of truth for fans. But think about the Star Wars games, or something like Cyberpunk Edgerunners. They're canon, but Within their respective universe, they're completely unrelated from the story of the original piece of media that inspired them. 
Leading up to the release of the Fallout show, Jonathan Nolan, the director of the series, said, It's almost like we're making Fallout 5. And I was pretty suspicious of this claim, because usually something as risky as a Fallout TV series would never be given the keys to the franchise kingdom. Because even when a project like this is poorly received by fans, it typically still manages to make a profit. So if that's the case, why not just tell a generic story that carefully steers clear of the established lore of the games? That way, if it fails, it's easier to sweep it under the rug and ignore. I thought we'd see a vault dweller from a vault we've never heard of emerge in a part of the wasteland we've never been to and proceed to engage in a generic facsimile of a main story quest that stays conveniently detached from anything established by the games. And I was sure that any connections that were made to the games would be carefully curated, Bethesda-approved story elements. Nothing concrete. When it was announced that the show would take place on the West Coast, I let out a pensive sigh, and I braced for a story that would almost certainly make no reference to the NCR, or any of the West Coast events established in the games that Bethesda didn't make. I prepared to see plot elements and designs ripped straight out of Fallout 3 and 4, which take place on the other side of the country. I thought this show would at best be an inoffensive and maybe a little forgettable self-contained adventure, and at worst that it would be hard to sit through, that it would be full of contradictions and contrivances that would continue the trend of splintering the lore between Bethesda's story and the one that the game's original creators seemingly ran out of time to tell. But that didn't happen. What happened was, well, it surprised me. And I'm about to get into spoilers about the show, but before I do, if you turned on this video to decide whether or not you should watch the Fallout series, the answer is a resounding yes. I will say that the pilot is superb. Episodes 2 and 3 started to feel a little rocky, but the remaining 5 episodes are absolute slam dunks, so don't let episodes 2 and 3 trick you, I guess. They almost tricked me. Anyways, now we're going to get into some spoilers, so, you know, goodbye if you don't want to be spoiled. Mute the video or something. I don't know. Do what you want. <clears throat> okay. Like I just said, I think the pilot episode was pretty damn near perfect. It really felt like we were witnessing the opening to a Fallout game. There were some familiar moments that called back to the games, but they felt more like snapshots than a true cliché or recycled formula. There's as much effort put into standing out as there is to capturing the authentic vibe of a Fallout game. And Vault 33 really delivers on this idea of supplying the new right alongside the old. Because it doesn't just set up one protagonist, it sets up two. Lucy becomes the familiar, adventurous vault dweller with carefully specced special stats and a mission out somewhere in the wasteland. She delivers well in all of those departments, but Norm becomes a new kind of protagonist. He stays behind and acts as something of a wild card, a free radical within the stuffy and isolated society of the vault. We've seen the aftermath of so many dystopian vault experiments in the Fallout series, but we've never seen such a conspiracy unfold firsthand in real time. The Norm subplot is distinctly new, and in my opinion, it's one of the more underrated aspects of the show. The series manages to blend the new with the old in Cooper's story, too. The scenes taking place in pre-war America were absolutely breathtaking. You know, Fallout 4, it tried to give us a look at pre-war America before bringing us into the wasteland, but frankly, it was a very small drop in a very, very large bucket of lore that Cooper's story brings to the table. On one side of the coin, you have another new role for Fallout. You have this regular human person trying to navigate the intensity and paranoia of the years leading up to the bombs dropping. And on the other side of that coin, you have this textbook, wasteland-hardened ghoul, a self-interested scoundrel with 
an air of charisma that very nearly manages to mask the bloodshed that follows him wherever he goes. Of the main characters in the series, I have to say that uh, Maximus is hes my least favorite. He had his moments, for sure, and the first episode gave him a pretty interesting setup by leaving his motivations and the nature of his actions unclear to the audience. It was hard to pin him down as someone that I should be rooting for or someone that I should dislike. But somehow, he manages to stay in that weird, wishy-washy, in-between moral state for the whole season. It's definitely an interesting idea for a character, and I think that maybe the intention was to frame him as kind of like a, a neutral guy, but the issue with that is that Maximus seems just as motivated as everyone else in the series. He also just seems to have no real idea of what he intends to actually achieve at any given moment, and not in a fun wild card sort of way, in a sort of placid, I'm just gonna make every decision on a whim kind of way. And by the fourth episode, he really just reads as a boring sociopath, which would be fine, but the latter four episodes seemed to be an attempt to rehabilitate his character in the audience's eyes. And that didn't really work for me because it didn't feel like he was developing into a better person. It just felt more like he was no longer being put in situations where acting immorally was convenient for him. And in all fairness, maybe this was the point. The role was acted incredibly well, and I have no idea what season two may have in store for him, but he just stuck out to me as the least compelling protagonist. Honestly, I wouldn't have been upset if his story had just ended with him staying inside of Vault 5. Him sitting down and watching popcorn was like the most I ever liked him. From the moment that Lucy exits the vault, I was I was pleasantly surprised by the way that the wasteland looked visually. This was the West Coast wasteland I remembered from Fallout 1 and 2, and I thoroughly enjoyed the fact that getting anywhere seemed to involve a pretty substantial trek through the empty desert, just as it was in the first two games. Slowly, I started to notice references that I didn't expect to see. Billboards for Sunset Sarsaparilla, the Gulper, which I originally groaned at for being a random Fallout 4 thing that had no business being on the west coast, upon further inspection, seemed to have been an axolotl that was experimented on through FEV, which is different from what they are in Fallout 4. Then, before I knew it, I was seeing Shady Sands and the NCR. And the show didn't just include the NCR, it made it one of the single most important story elements in the season. Every Bethesda Fallout game takes place on the East Coast and conveniently manages to dodge any references to the single largest and most successful government that has ever been formed inside the Wasteland. So we've all been asking, where is the NCR? And meanwhile, the show was building up a narrative to tell us just that. The NCR is gone but there's a reason for it. And it's presented as one of the most cataclysmic events in Fallout's history, which it absolutely is. It manages to finally merge the NCR with some of the ideas that Bethesda has been developing since Fallout 3. We got so much more information on the so-called Great Game, blending it with the vault tech conspiracy that the Enclave seemed to be laying the groundwork for in Fallout 2. This creates a much more unified and coherent interpretation of Fallout's collective lore. This show really does have the same narrative weight of an entire Fallout game, maybe even more. So overall, the series was way better than I could have imagined it, and it genuinely gives me hope for the future of the series. Zinc and I watched season one together, and immediately upon finishing it, we wanted to play Fallout 76, a game that we had been on the fence about trying for years, pretty much ever since it came out. So, that is all to say, I can't wait for season two. But just like any insufferable, entitled fanboy, I do have a list of nitpicks that, if I keep them inside, I might turn into a toxic, evil Twitter threatener or something. So, I'm just gonna rapid fire them here, just to, you know, get them out of my system. Alright? Does that make sense? Okay, here we go. 
These th these don't matter, but I'm just going to say them, okay? Uh, power armor that flies like Iron Man was completely unnecessary, and honestly, it only distracted and confused me when I saw it. If power armor's going to fly, it ought to have a jetpack fitted. Every ghoul that wasn't Cooper just looked like a generic zombie, and while I definitely understand that from a production standpoint, I'm sure zombie makeup prosthetics are cheap and plentiful, and makeup artists know how to do that, of course, in this industry, but they didn't have to have so much hair. I know not all ghouls in the games are bald, but most of them are, and the ghoul wigs were just so thick and fluffy that it was, they just started to distract me. I don't know. I felt like there were too many normal, not irradiated animals, and even the actual Brahmin that we saw seemed too healthy and nice looking, like it had all of its hair. This is something born in the wasteland, it should be, it should just be painful to lay eyes on, I think, in my opinion. It was nice to see some familiar weapon and item designs, but some of them just, whew, they really fell short, particularly this bastardized ripper that was used to decapitate Wilsig. I mean, where is the motor supposed to be? What is this? It's just, it's like a enormous Swiss army knife. I don't understand how this can cut off a head, but w whatever. The dog meat, or this this show's dog meat was cool, but I, I don't love the way that she just kind of helicoptered around the characters at various points in the show without doing anything. Um, I, I don't know. I just feel like you, I just wanted to see her do more things. That's, that's all I can say about it. Um, oh, and while we're on the topic of dog meat, I think the relationship between her and Wilzig really just kind of fell flat after they were separated in Philly. She went from being his loyal protector to not really seeming to care who she was with, and she also didn't really seem to care when Wilzig died. And Wilzig went from lying about her weight just to keep her and raise her and making a cute little bed inside of his wall for her because, like, she's his world to not even looking back for her as they fled Philly. I mean, I know the dude's foot got cut off, but it's, come on, it's your dog, man. That's more important than your life, I think. Anyway. Um, oh, and, and while we're talking about Wilzig, I wish we had spent more time with him before he had gotten his head chopped off. It seems like an odd choice to set him up in the first two episodes as this like really sympathetic character that has something important, only to chop his head off and turn him into a MacGuffin for the rest of the season. Like... You know, he, ju he just became the Pulp Fiction briefcase, and that's fine, but I just... Like, we, we saw so much of his backstory, so I don't know. Maybe they'll do more with that later. I don't know. Um, okay, now we're getting into the weeds. I really don't love the Fallout 4 style of vault interiors. Uh, you know, it makes sense. I get it. Implementing vault text colors more was definitely a cool idea, but... The ever-increasing volumes of sky blue and banana yellow that I'm seeing inside of vault Tech vaults just feels super weird, considering that all of them before Fallout 4 just didn't seem to adhere too closely to this color palette. Uh, I don't know, variety's the spice of life, right? I think the CRT screens in the show, uh, they just feel a little off to me, especially on the Terminals and the Pip-Boys. And I know that I only feel this way because I love CRTs. I have two of them in my bedroom, so I look at them all the time. So I'm sure that no one else cares about this, but I just, I noticed it and they look off. What can I say? Um, okay, Whew. last one. I get that every cell of the Brotherhood of Steel seems to operate with slightly different traditions and values, but a fully armored knight traveling with a defenseless squire whose only purpose is to carry a comically large pack full of supplies is just like, it feels so ridiculous to me. Am I am, like, am I taking crazy pills? Like, and it wouldn't be so bad if I saw them using the bag of supplies all the time, but I only ever saw Maximus pull out one single stim pack. You telling me there's one stim pack in there? L like, look, maybe that's representative of a, of a real Fallout protagonist's inventory, right? Because a Brotherhood of Steel Knight would want all that stuff. They'd want a ton of weapons. They'd want like 30 stim packs. They, you know, they want all those things. But one stim pack if, with like some gauze and stuff. What else is in there? Why? Do, why? Why did Broken Footboy like drag it away? Like it was so important. He had a fusion core and. And the Rataway was in the sleeve of the armor for some reason. So, and he couldn't, clearly there wasn't another stim pack in there because he didn't fix his foot. I don't know. I just, okay, look, those are completely inconsequential. They're not a big deal, I promise. But um, I'm glad I got them out of my system, okay? I think that's all I got. 
Oh, yeah, and look, we're done. Uh, what do you think of the new PC, eh? It's pretty sharp. I, uh, I'm mounting it to my wall. I'm gonna, this is gonna be like my, my tech wall. My console, my consoles and stuff are gonna go here. I'm gonna do like really ca careful cable management, my controllers and stuff. I'm gonna put up shelves, but, uh, you know, just get stuff off the floor. I got a Roomba, uh, so I can't, I, I can't have stuff on the floor like wires and things, because the Roomba will, it, it messes with it, so, uh, yeah, all right, hey, well, this is, this was fun, anyway, thanks for watching, uh, stay tuned for more, I've got some videos planned for May that I'm pretty excited about, so, uh, yeah, you know, just, just sit tight and wait for those, okay, bye.